That intro there's a little bit intense, isn't it? It's like a movie trailer. That's why I love it. I, I have y'all ever noticed though that movie trailers are always better than the movie? Have y'all noticed that? Like my son is he he always watches movie trailers. And he's like, Yeah, I've seen that movie. I said, Man, I'm like, you haven't seen the movie, you've seen the trailer, but the trailers are always so much better. But I I love that music right there. I just I, and some of the elders were picking one time about what's your Brian, you just want walkout music. I think walkout music would be cool, you know what I'm saying? I think it'd be absolutely awesome. Today, today we are starting our series in Jonah. We are starting our series. If you got your Bibles, go to Jonah. Hold on real quick, let me help you out. Open your Bible and go to the table of contents and look for a bunch of words that look like Star Wars characters. And Jonah's right there in the middle of it. In my, book, in my Bible, it's 920. 920, go ahead and find that. And uh, we are going to be in the book of Jonah for the next couple weeks. And uh, someone asked me why we're studying Jonah. I think we're going to work through that in just a little bit. And, and we're going to work through that the next four weeks. But here's the thing about the book of Jonah. Are you ready? If you're right and taking notes, if you're taking notes, you're still turning your Bibles, it's cool. But if you're taking notes, we want you to write, I want you to write this down. Jonah is a book about God's relentless pursuit of his rebellious people through a reluctant missionary. Okay? So this book is so misunderstood. I just want to be completely honest with you. This is one of those books here in America. We all kind of, when I say Jonah and the whale, we all kind of know it. There's toys. There's cartoons. Right now, media is filled with little stories for our children to see. Many of us have read this story to our children at bedtime. And, you know, going through this book, it's a book about a whale. And, and we want to make this as interactive as we can today. I asked the fire department to be here. They're going to spray water on y'all in just a minute. And uh, that way it feels interactive. I'm just joking. But it, we, we, we think of this book as a book about a man being swallowed by a whale, being spit out, being underwater. We think about, oh, yeah, he, he wanted to go to Ninevite. But when you think about it, we have taken a really provocative story and made it into like a children's bedtime story. Because when you study this book, this book is about idolatry. This book is about racism. This book is about rebellion to God. This, this book is about a selfishness of one man putting so many others in danger. There's a lot in here to this book. And even, to be honest with you, in a couple weeks, when we finish up this book, we all the book ends kind of harsh. It, it, it's not a tied up, nice, neat bow ending. I mean, I know when we tell our children, you know, Jonas was spit out, he went to Nineveh, they all praise God, and then we kind of stop. But then you read chapter 4 of this book, and it's there. Jonah really was still fighting with the calling on his life and struggle. And I think this book is, is really a good book for us to study. And this is why I think it's a good book to, for us to study. Someone asked me, he said, we come out of John, why are we going to Jonah? Because I think that this book, if, if you really start breaking it down, this book was intended for us to study. But now, the book of John, we constantly talked about how it was intended and it was written so that we would believe. John wrote it so that we would believe deeply in Jesus. This book, these four chapters, were written to be a mirror to man's soul. This book really does deal with stuff that we all deal with. This book is meant for us to take and reflect on our own souls. Because we are Jonah. Jo There's a Jonah in all of us. And all of us has so many traits of Jonah that we don't want to admit. 
but they're there. And I, I, I always wanted to teach out this book because many years ago I was kind of teaching in a youth group about this book, and I read this article, and it, it just fascinated me about the, the Jewish culture in, in, in the season of the Day of Atonement in Yom Kippur. This was before Jesus they would do this, and, and many temples still do this today. And I think it's kind of interesting because, guys, a lot of this book was written to a Jewish audience, right? And, and they, what they would do is every year on the Day of Atonement is a Jewish tradition that they would gather and they would read about Jonah. And they would study Jonah. And then all the church and all the temple, they would all stand and they would say, we are Jonah. We are Jonah. We are Jonah. Because this book, if we study and reflect it, there is something in all of us that we are Jonah. We are Jonah. Jonah. Listen, I am Jonah. You are Jonah. Individually and collectively as a church and as a church in America, we all run from God and his faithfulness. We all run from the promises he keeps us and he relentlessly pursues us. And today, and as we study this book, my prayer is that we recognize where we are running from God in our lives. And we turn and do what Jonah didn't do, but we repent and we turn back to God. And we see and we, and we submit to the obedience and to the faithfulness. Here's my prayer, that we be better than Jonah. That we recognize the Jonah in our lives and we be better than Jonah. Now some of you are like, whoa, 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 I literally thought Jonah got swallowed by a whale three days later thrown out. Yes, let's get to that. Let's go ahead and get to it. Verse 17 and 18. Go down. Go down. You ready? Verse 17 and 18. Here we go. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. All right? All right, here we go. Now, on the other side of that, I know for certain there's someone in here going, this is just a myth. This is just a story that they've told for thousands of years for people to recognize. It was just a teaching tool. It, it, it didn't really happen. It, it was, Brian, it was, it was like, it was like a parable. It, Brian, and I understand some of you because there's like, there is no way, there's no way that a human being could go into the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. I would respond to you, yep, that doesn't make sense to me either. I've never seen a fish big enough to swallow a man. I've, I've never seen it. Now, I've been told that there's a catfish in the Jordan, the, lake, the Jordan Lake up here that's as big as a Volkswagen. Never seen it, like to, but I've been told, okay? It's a rumor that I once heard, all right? And I've heard that there are, there are catfish that are that big. I, I, I've seen a whale before, and they're that big. And you say, but, but if you, like someone could be swallowed by a whale, live there for three days. Three, okay, here's for me. Here's what I'm saying. I believe that this is completely true. And here's why I believe that this is completely true. I know it's hard to believe, but I believe it's completely true because in Matthew 12, 40, Jesus said, for Jonah in the belly of a huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. If Jesus believed it to be true, it's got to be true. And I know you're like, but Brian, it's impossible. And a lot of people and a lot of scholars who will tell you that it's impossible for a man to live in the the belly of a fish for three days are the same folks that will tell you that there was once two particles just floating around and boom, they hit. And now we have fingers and toes and eyeballs in an ecosystem, okay? If you can believe that, you should be able to believe a a man living in a bed, right? Now, I don't believe that's how the world was created because I know it wasn't created that way because there had to be a greater being with intelligent design and that intelligent design was a man named Yahweh God and he sent his son named Jesus to the earth. And it is still hard for me to believe that in all of my sinfulness, in all of my sin, that Jesus would come and live a perfect life and die on the cross for my sins. And it is hard for me to believe that he died a brutal death and three days later that he rolled a stone away and came out and lived so I never had to face death. But I want to be honest with you, I believe it's true because I've seen him do things in my life that only that man can do, and his name is Jesus. So that's my synopsis. I believe this is true, and I believe it happened. And I believe it happened because there's a Jonah in all of us. There's a Jonah in all of us. All right, so let's start. Let's jump in. Now, that was a long intro, so everybody should be at the book by now, okay? 
All right, that's why I did that, okay? Are we all there? Some of you are like on your app. You just went, whoop, got it, nailed it. All right, that's cool. All right, so let's read. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of the Amorite, and said, Arise, go to Nineveh, a great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come before me. All right, so here's the thing. Jonah is a prophet. Jonah is a man of God, and what a prophet is, is a man at this time that God would speak to, and whatever he spoke to that prophet, that prophet would go and obey and go tell the nation what was going on. And as we see here, God has spoken to Jonah, and he's saying, you need to go to Nineveh and tell the people. Now, this is not a huge deal for Jonah in in some ways, and this is why, because if you study 1 Kings 14, because when we study scripture, we got to study the whole scripture, right, so we can know the context, Jonah, uh, Jonah has already done this once before. He's already gone into the king's courts of Joab and told Joab something that God had told him. So he's done this before. God is calling him to do something that he's already done. Really quickly, I want to take a second. Some of you are sitting in this room and you're going, okay, Brian, you're going to start talking about calling. You're going to start talking about sharing the gospel. So there's people in this room that are called in to be preachers and they, it's time for them to go preach. And I understand, okay, yes, yes, I believe there's men in here. I believe there's young men right here that are called to be preachers. I believe they're out here in this room. There's some of you men that are called into preaching and sharing the gospel. But I also believe that he's called to go talk, to go talk and tell the Ninevites. And I know for sure, because I hang out with you guys a lot, y'all all can talk. Some of you can talk really well. Some of you ladies in this room, your cars don't drive unless you're on the phone. Anybody else got a wife like that? Like the car won't go into drive unless they're on the phone? All right. It's true. We talk, right? We communicate. We, as any other, as any other people group who's ever lived, us right here in this culture, we communicate better than anybody, right? So if God has called Jonah to go and communicate, why can't God call us to go and communicate, right? But here's the thing that we need to, uh, as we look at this, though, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing here that's a little different, though, right? He says, arise and go to Nineveh, a great city, a great city. Here's the first point that we're going to unpack right here. God will often ask us to do things we don't want to do, okay? God's often going to ask us to do things we don't want to do. Now you say, wait a second, Brian, you've said that he's done this before. What do you mean he doesn't want to do this? God's asking Jonah to go to the Ninevites. Now remember, where did Jonah go the first time? He went to the Jewish folks. He went to folks who already were seeking God and looking to do what God wanted to do. God's now asked him to go to a people that don't know God. That, that, that served other gods, that served other idols. And then when you start really studying it, he's asking them, you see this, it says great city? This was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were completely ruthless. For some of you men, let me give you, do you remember in 300? It's a movie about crossfitters that are all buff, right? Only me, I've only seen that movie? Okay, whatever. But they fight against the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were known to be completely ruthless. As I was studying this week, some of the ways that the Assyrians would take out uh, on their enemies, some of the things that they would do was unbelievably brutal. And the Assyrians were known for being brutal, and they were known to be in the enemy. And you're like, who are they the enemy to? They were really the enemy to everyone. They were the, and they were definitely the enemy to Israel. So God is asking Jonah... To go and speak to a violent people that were the enemy to Israel about their evil. He's wanting them to go call out the sins of the sinners who didn't want to hear that they were sinners. This, this was a big moment, right? This was, this was not just what well, Jonah was on. No. No, this was a dangerous, dangerous calling. This was a dangerous calling. Look at verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it uh, and to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, real quick, leave that verse up there. There's two times in one verse that it says he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He was running from the presence 
of the Lord. See, Nineveh was, yes, a dangerous place. He did not like the Ninevites. He did not like those people. He did not feel like they deserved God's grace. He did not feel like they deserved to know the God. But then on the other side of it, too, though, is he just he didn't just decide, I'm not going to go. He decided, I'm going to run completely from the presence of the Lord. I'm, he's not just being disobedient. He is going as far away from the presence of the Lord as he can. That leads me to the second point that I think we all need to know and understand. When God calls you to something, you can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction. When God calls you into something, there will always be a boat very available for a simple, easy fare to take you opposite of God's presence. To take you opposite of where God is calling you to go. And see, here's the thing for me is I feel like in our culture, we're so used to people running from God's presence and running from what God's doing in their life. We almost cheer it on. We almost are like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. It's like someone, if somebody came to me and they were like, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. I thought that just a little illustration of if you said, hey, Brian, I need to meet with you this afternoon. And we sit down and you're like, you know, God's really stirring in my heart to go and take a missions trip. Like God's really like he's he's I think he wants me to take my family on a missions trip and serve him. But my office just said I could I want a free trip to Vegas by myself. I feel like that's a better deal, right? Right? This is going to be a boat taking the... Now, listen, you may say, I'm going to go to Vegas and do missions work. If you are, don't take me. That's why I've never been to Vegas. But listen, the scary thing is so many times, though, in our culture, we almost give people permission to get on the wrong boat. Because the wrong boat normally is going to make sense, right? Because let's not, let's not go back from this moment. Nineveh is a dangerous, scary place. Jonah could lose his life. I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah, you should probably not go there. That, that, yeah, that makes sense. Listen, the calling we have on our life is never meant to be a safe, comfortable one. Calling from God is dangerous. I was thinking about this this week. When I was, uh, I was about 20, 21 years old, and I was at... Uh, at Wingate University, and I was, it was in my second senior year. I did my first senior year so well, I decided to stay for another one. Um, but I was there, and uh, I was with FCA. I was a big leadership and fellowship of Christian athletes. And we had a guy come in, and he was, he was recruiting young men. to. He was, like, trying to get us to go to Charlotte for this educational thing. And he was calling men to share the gospel in far-reach people groups. And he sat there, and I remember sitting with my buddies, and I'll never forget who I'm, I was sitting beside Walker on one side and Shane on the other side. They're probably watching, and and uh, and we were sitting there, and the guy was like, "Hey, we're gonna you're gonna go into India, and it's gonna take a year to train. You're not just gonna train on the Bible. You're gonna train like physically because you're gonna be hiking into places where there's no electricity, and you're gonna be going into these far reach people groups. So you know, being young, full of testosterone, I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna get off." be like a navy seal for jesus and we're like hitting each other we're like we're gonna get so jacked for the gospel and like and we're like we're gonna do this and the guy was like yeah and he's talking to us and then we go up afterwards and we're like yeah we're gonna sign up we're gonna do this we're gonna take a a year he's like a year to three years and we'll send you up there and and these people have never heard the gospel saying we're like yeah we're all about he goes we only send 12 we send you out two by two and we only send 12 up last year we were so excited because uh because six came back And we're like, yeah. And we're like, wait, what, six? Why? And they were like, we don't know. Either they, either, you know, they gave their life for the gospel and died, or or we don't know what happened to them. And we were like, yeah, we're doing it. So I called home and I was telling my mom about it. And she was like, God spoke to me. That's not your calling. (laughs) So I walk out of my bedroom and I'm like, shame, man. God spoke to my mom. He said, God spoke to my mom the same way. But you know what? I, I, as I was thinking about that this week, I couldn't help but think, man, would I still be willing to go? Like, because back, I mean, I'll be real honest, back then, I probably had three pairs of pants and one shirt. I had a book bag for school. I didn't have, man, if I had $20 in my pocket, I was rich. I, had, I really had no responsibility. I was just passionate about Jesus. And, and I was thinking this week, I, I got a beautiful wife. I got three kids. I got a mortgage. I got a staff. I got a church. I got people to depend on me. 
if God called me to go to India, would I be willing to go? Like, would I be willing to go? I was like, if I went home tonight and was like, hey, Jess, kids, God's called me to India, I'm pretty, my family would be like, all right, have fun. <laughs> Can you leave your keys? No, I'm just, but would I still be willing to go? Because, you know, as we get older, more gets on the line, right? Not just more gets on the line. We get more comfortable. We, we build these lives completely filled with comfort. Man, would I still go? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite, I quote him all the time. His book, Calls for Discipleship, changed my life when I read it. But he says, when Christ calls a man, he binds him to come and die. Is my relationship with Jesus not just dying to myself? Am I willing to give it all to Christ? Because here's, here's the thing. I think many of us, we spend our whole lives running from God's calling on our lives. And, and I, if you're taking notes, write this down. It is easy to run from God, but it is impossible to outrun him. Because when you get to where you think he's not, he's waiting on you. Because he loves you so much, he's going he's gonna to relentlessly come after you. Look at verse 4. But the Lord, the Lord, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So the ship was threatened to break apart. The mariners were afraid, and they come crying, out, cried out to his God, and they hurled their cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. And Jonah had gone down to the inner parts of the ship and lay down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, Do you mean you sleeper? Now, real quick, before we go any further, some of us get so comfortable in our sin, we can sleep in the middle of it. Some of us, we, we have been running from God, from the calling on our life for so long, we actually can fall asleep in the middle of running from God. I mean, everybody else is flipping out and, and throwing cargo, and this is the worst, and Jonah's just down there catching Z's. I just pray that, that I, I never get to the point in my life where I'm so comfortable in my sin that I'm asleep. But the captain comes down and says in verse 6, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give uh, us thought that we may not perish. Here's the third point I want you to write down this morning is, God may just send a storm to get your attention. God may just send a storm to wake you up from what you're sleeping in. See, I think so many times we in our culture, we need to understand this really quickly. God's not going to leave us alone, and storms are not always bad. We think that storms are somehow bad, but storms are not always bad. If we love God, why, why wouldn't God just bless us? Why wouldn't God just do whatever we wanted to? I saw an interview, uh, this guy, y'all may have heard him, Kanye West, right? We've all heard of Kanye West, right? And Kanye West, you know, he went through this thing where he got saved and he made a Christian album and all this. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Like he, he's, he's done. He's done with that. His last album was completely derogatory. It was horrible. And he was being interviewed. And when he was being interviewed, they asked him about it. He said, yeah, I tried the God thing. But you know what? I just think it's a waste of time because I prayed about a bunch of stuff. And he never gave me what I wanted. And my value went down. And things in my life just didn't really get better. So I just realized there is no God. Kanye, you serving the wrong God, bro. You are your own God. Because there's, listen, there's going to be storms in your life. Sometimes the storms are things you've done to bring them into your life. But sometimes storms are in your life so God can wake you up and get your attention. Storms are not always a bad thing. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called according to his purpose. God has a purpose in every storm in our life. Every storm, there's a purpose. Now, I want us to be real clear here, though. Let's be honest. Let's, let's, let's be honest as a church. And I read this this week in a commentary. I thought it was, it said, let's serve notice here that God was prepared to break down the ship, throw Jonah over, uh, break down the ship, drown Jonah, and let all of these sailors and idolatry worshipers die and perish because of one man's rebellion. God was prepared for it all to go down and let them all die just because of one man. And in saying that, I want to, here's a real hard truth. Are you ready? Every sin and every sinner that's running from the presence of God, there's going to be collateral damage. Come on, church, y'all know it's true. Some of you have some years of wisdom. Isn't it true? Sin doesn't just affect you. It affects people around you, doesn't it? 
Your sin is not just about you. It's gonna, there's collateral damage for sin sinners. When you're running from the presence of God, you're like, hey, don't, hey, don't worry about it, Brian. It's just, it, it ain't affecting nobody but me. It's affecting other people. It always does. And that's a hard, hard truth. Let me give you another hard truth while I'm making it uncomfortable. Let's make it real uncomfortable. You ready? Some of you aren't Jonah, but you've got a Jonah in your life. Some of you aren't Jonah, but on your ship, there's a Jonah. You need to throw him overboard. Some of you need to pull your phone out and take that number and delete it. Some of you need to go on your social media and stop looking at certain person or family or what they're doing because it stirs up something in you that's a storm and it's not good for you. It's okay to throw some Jonas off. It's okay. Because some of us, we allow other people who are running from the presence of God and we become collateral damage. There's storms in our life. There's storms in our life that don't need to be there because we're allowing those things to be there. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't love people. We shouldn't take care. We should do all we can to help people see and know the goodness and grace of Christ. But there's sometimes you've got to protect yours and your family. And sometimes I think so many of us, we allow people and things into our life that aren't healthy and good. We, We almost invite the storms in. We don't have to do that. You know what we need to do? We need to, what in verse 6? We need to wake up. We need to wake up. We need to wake up and see what God's doing in our life. That's why we're doing this series. This is, this is us. This is me and you together holding this mirror up and looking and saying, what is it, Lord? What is it that you're calling me to? What is it that I've been ignoring? What is it that you need me to do? Because God has a calling on all of your lives. This church, we we desire to equip you to fulfill your God-given purpose. And your God-given purpose is to love God, love people, and make disciples. Now, where in your life are you not doing that? Where are you running from that? Where what is it that God's calling you to? Because that's why we're studying this. Look at verse 7. And they said to one another, Let us cast lots that we may know to whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. Listen, if God is in, if, if God is in complete control of the water and the storm, I'm pretty sure he's in control of the lots, right? They're casting these things. It fell on Jonah. Verse 8. Then he said to them, Tell us whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and dry land. Okay, come on, Jonah. Seriously? Like now you start glorifying God? Now that you don't got caught? Now, now that, I mean, you know, there's a big difference in repentance when God moves and when you get caught, right? Come on, parents. Y'all know, y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm saying? There's a huge difference. And right here, Jonah's caught, and now he's like, I fear God. Do you? Because you were sleeping pretty good. You were sleeping pretty good down there. Verse 10. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, "What What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Really quickly, I want you to realize something, guys. People see your sin. People see your sin. Those guys knew he was fleeing from God, right? They knew they, they knew something wasn't right. And here's the craziest thing to me, though, and this is my prayer for us as a church. Are you ready? That we get so comfortable in this Christian bubble that we build that we, we only surround ourselves with people that are like-minded, with people that worship what we worship and do what we do, that we get ourselves in this nice little tight Christian bubble, and then all of a sudden we get on the wrong boat, and we start going this way, and the world is the one out there going, man, y'all say y'all are Christian, y'all follow Jesus, but that doesn't look right. Because isn't that what's happening? The people that don't know God are like, Jonah, something right, bro. Jonah. The other thing is real quick. Where are Jonah's friends? Do y'all realize we read this whole book, there's nowhere in here that Jonah has any accountability, he has no friends, he has nobody to speak into his life? If you're living a life when you don't have someone who can speak truth and love into your life, you you have a very good potential to become Jonah. You need people to speak in your life. Verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do? 
that the sea may quiet down, uh, down for us. The sea grew more and more tempestuous, and he said to them, People, uh, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it's because we are, uh, this great tempest has come upon us. Nevertheless, the men rode harder to get back to dry land, and they could not. For the sea grew more and more. It, it, it's raging. Here's the crazy thing. When you read this, sometimes you're like, Jonah's like, just pick me up. Like, almost like he's a sacrificial lamb. You know, just pick me up and throw me in. How selfish is that? How selfish is that? He's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, Jew, I'm a Jewish. We, we don't believe in suicide, so y'all are going to have to kill me. Like, he's not being sacrificial here. You know what sacrificial would be? To fall on his face before these men and repent before God and say, I'm running from the presence of the Lord. I need to turn, my, I need to turn back to him. We got to turn back so I can go to Nineveh to tell He needed to repent, and instead of that, he's like, here's what, dude, just throw me in. He's wanting someone else to do his dirty work for him, isn't he? But here's the crazy thing. What does it say in verse 13? Nevertheless, the men started rowing harder. Guys, the sailors were being more compassionate to Jonah than Jonah was to them. Think about that. That Jonah, the prophet of God, is, not, is being selfish, is not worried about them doesn't care about them, and they're like, no, no, we're not going to throw you overboard. We'll keep rowing. We'll get you out of this, buddy. The sailors are literally being nicer to him than he is to them. But here's the thing I want you to consider. Jonah never demonstrated a changed heart. In this moment, Jonah never said, I'm wrong, I repented. He, that's what he, he, the easy thing would be to repent before God and do the right thing, but no. Verse 14. Therefore, they called out to the Lord. Who's they? These are now the sailors are calling out to the Lord. O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay it not us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done as it pleases you. So they picked up, they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. The sailors are now worshiping Yahweh. Here's one of the big things we can pull from this, though, is God has a purpose and plan to redeem the world, and he's going to do it no matter whether you're on board or not. Right? Now, you can run all you want to, and in your running, you, you may say, I'm running because I just I don't want that to happen. I, I, I don't want these things to happen. They're going to happen anyway because God's plan is going to always be fulfilled. Somehow we think we, we control that. God's going to do what he wants to do. But here's the biggest thing I think we need to remember. There is a Jonah in every one of us in this room. Every one of us. I want you to go back to verse 2. Can you put verse 2 back on the screen? Verse 2. Arise, go into Nineveh. Tell them. Arise, go into them. Tell them their sins. Tell them there's one true God. Tell them if they repent from their sins and they turn and worship the one true God, evil won't become upon them. You're like, okay, Brian. Jonah had a call. Jonah had a command. Jonah had a, 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 a commission. We do too. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It's eerie how close the words are. It says, Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I command you, and remember that I am with you always to the end of the age. Listen, if we in this room, if we call ourselves saved, then we should call ourselves sent. If you are saved, you are sent. If you know Jesus as your personal Savior, God has commissioned you and commanded you and called you. He has not suggested. He has not given you an option. He has said to you, go. Go. 
Some of you are called to go across the halls of your home and disciple and raise your children in a godly home. Some of you are called to go across the cubicle at work. Some of you are called to go down the road in your neighborhood. Some of you are called to go to an athletic field. Some of you are called to when you're shopping to make sure you're building a relationship with that checkout girl that's always there so that you can go and tell her about Jesus. Some of you are called to go into India and sacrifice your life. Some of you are called to go to Thailand. Some of you are called to go to the ends of the earth. And guess what? Here's the, here's the, here's the thing. You ready? ready? Don't be Jonah. Don't be Jonah. We are called to share the good news of Jesus. We are called to proclaim his glory over everything. We are called to go into hard, difficult situations. You're like, Brian, but I'm not, I can't talk to them. You don't understand. I know it might be hard, but that doesn't mean you're not called to it. We are called to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Here's the crazy thing about this story when you really start studying it. Some of you, I'm saying this right now, and you're going, okay, Brian, you're calling me into this act of obedience, and I just, oh, man, I just... I'm not calling you today to change immediately. I'm not calling you today to be like, boom, I surrender to Jesus, so tomorrow i got to go to seminary. Right? I'm going to go in tomorrow morning, I'm gonna quit my job, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm gonna, listen, I'm going to go home tonight, I'm going to put everything I have for sale, and we're going to move to Botswana, Africa. I, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Now, if God called you to do that, that's kind of cool. You're a little crazy, but that's kind of cool, all right? But here's what I am saying. If you study this, when the storm showed up, they were 2,500 miles away from Joppa. This was not the story where Jonah got on the boat. He got on the boat, and then the next morning they woke up to a storm. Somehow we, sometimes we think that's how it worked. This was days, maybe even months, maybe, maybe a year. That, that's how long they've been selling away. Some of you in this room, you've been running from your calling for years. God called you into the ministry. He called you to preach. And you said, ah, and you took the other boat. And now you're comfortable. And yet you know right now you are called. Some of you in this room, you're called to be missionaries. And you built an incredible comfort life. And you're like, but Brian, I'm about to be retired. Maybe retirement is the mission field. I, I don't know. But I want to tell you this morning, listen, you don't have to turn immediately, but it took you this long to get here. Maybe today would you pray a prayer to commit? I'm willing to go wherever you call me to go. I might not be able to go tomorrow. I might tomorrow need to be start preparing. I need to do, but I'm called, so I'm going to turn today and I'm going to start taking steps to go where you've called me to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing things in my life that, that are a little bit more uncomfortable so I can go and be what you called me to be. Because I don't want to be Jonah. I don't want those around me to have to experience the people around Jonah, what they experienced. What is God calling you to? Paul Tripp writes a book called Dangerous Calling. And it's a book for pastors or people feeling called into pastoralship. And if you feel like God's calling you into pastoralship, I suggest you buy this book, Dangerous Calling, and read it. Because it's going to do one or two things. One, you're going to put it down and go, nope, never want to do that. <laughs> Or you're going to go, oh my gosh, this is what God's doing in my life. But he says something in one of his chapters, and it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to read it to you because I think it best describes, and it best describes the church I fear and what I fear in my life. And it says this, I'm convinced, being Paul Tripp, I'm convinced that the biggest crisis for the church of Jesus Christ is not that we are easily dissatisfied, but that we are all so easily satisfied. We have regular... Uh, we. We have a regular and pervasive ability to make things work that are, not, that are not and should not be working. We learn to adjust things that we should alter. We learn to be okay with things that we should be confronting. We learn to avoid things that we should be facing. We would rather be comfortable and hold on to our comforts than open ourselves to accountability. We swindle ourselves into thinking that the things are better than they really are. And in, in so doing this, we compromise the calling and standards that God has on our life to love and serve. We are like sick people who are afraid to go to the doctor. We collect evidence that points that we are healthy and that we are really good when our hearts are broken and dirty. We know we are sick. 
But we would rather settle for humans second best than God's grace and the calling he has on our life. I don't want that to be said about me. Or you. Or you. As Katrina comes up, I want to ask you, where's your Nineveh? Who is your Ninevite? What is it that God is calling you to? I just think it's absolutely incredible that, that the, the, the Jewish church once a year would just acknowledge, man, we're not doing it right. We're running from God. What is it that God is, God is stirring in your heart? And today, you can kind of set a stake and say, today, I'm turning. I'm going back. To, and it's, it's taken me a long time to get this far away, but I'm going to start doing the work to fulfill my calling, to tell people about Jesus. Who is it right now on your heart? Somebody in this room, you've got somebody that you cannot let go of. They're on your heart, their mind. You can't stop thinking about them. That's the person that you are called to go share Jesus with. That's what we like to call right here, your one. We all have one. They're your one. And listen, when you share with your one, it's not going to be like that. It, it's, a, it's a long journey. It's a walk. Discipleship's a walk. It's a, it's a long time. And, and it's going to be ups and downs. But you've you got to have people in your life to keep you from straying and getting on the wrong boat. And you need to be somebody in somebody's life helping them make sure that they're on the path. And loving them and praying for them. And, and speaking to them. I mean, discipleship is not, hey, we're going to do discipleship for six weeks, see ya. Discipleship is a lifetime. There's young men, there's a guy I talk to every Friday, every Friday morning we talk. You know why? Because I've been discipling him since he was 15 years old. And every Friday we talk. Sometimes it's about spiritual things, sometimes it's about the masters, sometimes it's, it's fun stuff, but, but you know what? I'm in his life and he's in my life, and my, and my prayer for him is that I don't want him to get on the wrong boat. I don't want him to be Jonah, because I've been Jonah in my life. He's been Jonah. You've been Jonah. What is it that God's calling you to? Every one of you in this room have purpose and calling on your life, and it's not just to come and sit. It's to go. He did not say, hey, Jonah, sit down. Sit down. And the Ninevites are coming to you. He did not say in Matthew, Jesus not to tell his disciples, hey, just sit here, they're going to come to you. He said, go. And when he said go, he said, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. I mean, look at his disciples. Every single one of them gave their life for the gospel. Every one of them gave their life to die for the gospel. If we should be so lucky that we could give our life for the gospel. What is he calling you to? What is it? My favorite moments of the week are right now because it's when God speaks to you. Would you bow your head? Father, we surrender and open our lives to you. Lord, first, before I pray, there, there may be, and I'm pretty certain there probably is, somebody in here that doesn't know you. They feel like a Ninevite. And this morning, they, they heard hard truth and they recognize and see their sin and that they don't know the one true God, that they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I pray that this morning that they know that the prayer that they can pray is easy as the ABCs, but it is life-changing. It's admitting that they're a sinner. It's admitting that they need Jesus. They need you. It's believing fully on who you are, believing that you died on the cross for them and you rose from there three days later. And then it's committing their life to you. Committing their life to not be a Jonah, but to take your good news to the rest of the world. Father, I pray if there's someone in here this morning that as I was walking through that, they're, they're making that decision. That if someone watching online is making that decision. But for us that have made that decision before, as we sit in here, Lord, we now come to you with open hearts, admitting to you, openly admitting doing what Jonah didn't do, we're going to repent and open ourselves and say, we have strayed, we have gone away from our calling, we have allowed things in our lives and comforts in our life to be distraction and, and to just be 
more satisfaction than what we're really called to be. Lord, let us not be that anymore. Call us. Speak to us. Speak to us. Lord, we don't even know what you're calling us to. We, we know we're not equipped, but we want to be willing. Lord, I pray that you're speaking to your people right now. Speak to them. Speak to them. Would you stand? The altar is going to be open. Katrina is going to sing this song over us. If you need to fill out a prayer card, I encourage you to fill out a prayer card. If you just need somebody to pray for you, if you want to come and pray, if you want to talk to somebody about salvation, this is your time. But we're just going to sing over this invitation moment.